to our service this morning here at the Tron. We will begin properly in just a moment or two. Perhaps you join me as musicians play as we have an opportunity to quieten our minds and hearts and voices and prepare ourselves to come before the Lord to hear his word and to respond with all of our hearts. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we have esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes we are healed. We're going to sing together as we begin this morning, number 433, Man of Sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah. What a Savior.
Well, as we sit, let's join our hearts together in prayer. Let's pray. Lord our God, as we come before you this Lord's Day morning, rejoicing and, and singing hallelujah because of our great Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, we find our, our rejoicing is fulsome and joyful, and yet at the same time it is it's filled with reverence and awe as we sing these words about the spotless Lamb of God lifted up to die so that we, so guilty, so vile and helpless, that we should live through his death for our sins. For it was our sins that put him there. In our place condemned, he stood so that he might seal our pardon with his blood when he came to reclaim us as ruined sinners to be ransomed forever by his precious blood. And so, Lord, would you help us to understand it, help us to take it in, what it meant to thee, the Holy One, to, to bear away our sin. And so as we gather this morning around your word and, and read again the word of the cross, lest we forget Gethsemane, lest we forget thine agony, lest we forget thy love to each one of us, to me. Lead us all, we pray, to Calvary. And so grant, we beseech the almighty God that we who for our evil deeds do worthily deserve to be punished by the comfort of thy grace may be mercifully relieved through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, let me welcome you warmly uh, to our fellowship this morning on this rather miserable day. Seems we've gone back from spring to winter again, doesn't it? Let's hope it doesn't last too long. But if you're here for the first time, then you're very welcome indeed. Uh, we have a chance, hopefully, to meet you and greet you after the service. And uh, we hope you'll feel very much at home with us here as a fellowship of God's people. Uh, these sheets are on your uh, chairs, I think. And they give you details on the front of our other services today, this afternoon and this evening. If you're not involved in the uh, Pharisee service or the Queen's Park service, do come and join us along at Kelvin Grove uh, for our uh, evening service at 6.30. On the inside there, you'll see details on the left about uh, things going on today, the young people's work and so on. On the right about... Uh, this coming week and uh, you'll see among all the different things there Wednesday evening is small groups if you've been here a little while and you haven't yet found your way into one of our small group Bible studies please let me encourage you to do that uh, speak to me or speak to one of the folks on duty after the service we'll be glad to tell you about that there are uh, cards and uh, information details also in the racks at the doors uh, but we really encourage folk to get into a small group in the midweek if they can uh, it's a great chance to learn together and to encourage one another uh, in our Christian faith. On the back page, some things for the future. Uh, I'll be away next Sunday. Edward's going to be taking the morning services and the other ones, as you'll see there. Then let me remind you about the Cornhill Day Conference on the 23rd of March. For anybody who's involved in um, teaching the Bible to others, whether it's just with one other person that you read, whether you teach a Sunday school class or a small group or... Uh, any other sort of thing, students, uh, camps, uh, really something there for all of us if we want to learn how to handle the Bible better. So do uh, think about coming along to that. There are details and cards outside. Then Easter will soon be upon us, and you'll see there we're running a holiday club again at Queen's Park, and there'll be also the, uh, the boys' football club uh, through the auspices of Hope for Glasgow. So uh, do take note of that and uh, act accordingly. Well, I'll leave you to read the rest of these notices at your leisure. Do do that and uh, use these sheets to help you in your prayers as we pray together for the work of the church throughout the week. But um, we're going to turn now to our Bible reading this morning. You'll find it in Matthew's Gospel, uh, chapter 26. Continuing our studies in, in Matthew's preaching of the cross. And uh, we looked last week at... 
the upper room. We're going to read again uh, most of that same passage and further on into the story of uh, Gethsemane. These two parts of the chapter go very much together. So we're going to begin reading at Matthew 26 at verse uh, 20. And that's uh, page 832 if you have one of the visitor's Bibles. When it was evening, uh, Jesus reclined at table with the twelve. And as they were eating, he said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were sorrowful and began to say to him, one after another, Is it I, Lord? He answered, He who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Judas, who would betray him, answered, Is it I, Rabbi? He said to him, You have said so. Now as they were eating, that is the Passover, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave thanks to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup when he had given thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered him, Though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night, before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. Taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for a third time, saying the same words again. And he came to the disciples and said to them, Sleep on and take your rest. See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hand of sinners. Amen. And may God bless to us his word. We're going to sing now together number 773 in our blue books that speaks of the truth of the gospel of the cross of Christ, that we are debtors to his mercy alone. And it's of that covenant mercy of God, faithful to the end, that we sing. Number 773. <laughs> Thank you. 
Well, as the uh, musicians play in the quiet now, our uh, offerings for the Lord's work will be received. You might like to read over again these words that we'll be studying shortly. As we do that, our offerings will be received. pray together. The words of the music say, may the fragrance of our Lord Jesus fill this place. And, O oh God, our Father, our desire is that his fragrance should fill this whole world. How we thank you that we have your sure and certain promise that that will be so. That there is a day coming when your glory will fill this whole world from east to west, from shore to shore, as the waters cover the sea. But until then, O oh Lord, we cry to you for a world that is in such darkness, such despair, such confusion and lostness, and a world in which when we look out upon it, we see everywhere in such a multitude of ways, the evidence of the terrible curse of sin that we human beings have brought upon this world, sullying it, making it so much less than the world as you created it to be as a theater for your great glory. And our foolishness, our absurd and wicked rebellion against your perfect rule, far from giving us the world that we thought our hearts longed for, has given us a world which we so often long to escape. Think of the sadnesses all around our world, through every nation and community, so many families, so many people's individual lives filled with sorrows and frustrations and griefs and woes, all ultimately stemming from the fallenness, the curse upon this world. We think, Lord, of the awful sorrow that has come so suddenly to so many families with this uh, air crash in Ethiopia. We think of the Daily, it seems, tragic sorrow coming to families in our own nation through these awful knife attacks <coughs> and murders. 
We think of the tragedy of ruptured relationships at the deepest, most intimate levels within families and marriages, within friendships, communities, and even between nations where it seems today there's a rising tide of nation warring against nation, whether it be currency wars, trade wars. And sometimes we fear, and indeed we see in some cases, violent military wars. Lord our God and our Father, we come before you asking for your mercy that you would stay the hand of evil and wickedness in this world and in our own nation and grant us a reprieve, grant us protection from ourselves, from that which comes not from outside, alas, but from within the hearts of men and women. We thank you, Lord, that in your grace and mercy you do give us law and order, government, rule, which, however imperfect and, and sometimes even very corrupt, still is a gift of your grace to restrain evil and to punish wickedness and to promote and to praise that which is good and wholesome and healthy. And we pray, Lord, for our own government in these days of great turmoil and upset and confusion, so much distraction over this issue of Brexit and the future. We pray for our own government, Lord, that you would enable her to fulfill these first and foremost primary functions that all government is on this earth for, to promote good and prevent evil. We pray that those with the rule over us would know the difference between these things, which so often seems to be becoming clouded and even greatly confused in our society. And to that end, Lord, we pray for the church of Jesus Christ in this, our nation, so greatly despised and rejected in our day, so denuded of influence and of authority, but because so often and so greatly the truth of your word, the clarity of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ has been lost, not outside but inside the very church that proclaims it. Forgive us, Father, for in so many cases we have known what we have done in seeking to make your gospel more palatable to those who despise it, more understandable perhaps in a world that is turned against you, somehow thinking that we have more wisdom than you in speaking your words of salvation to this earth. We pray, Lord, for your church in our land that we would be a people <clears throat> bowed in penitence, humbly re-seeking the authority of your words and yours alone that throughout the churches of our land, all these islands today, wherever and gathers in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the words that will be spoken and heard will be not the words of man, but the words of God. Not therefore the words of puny, power-lacking philosophy, but of powerful, saving glory the true message of a cross of a crucified Savior dying for the sins of many. And so, Lord, we ask for ourselves that as we turn to your word this morning, and once again we come to the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ and its meaning and its proclamation to us, we ask that you would open our eyes and our hearts that we may see afresh again with great clarity what is so supremely clear in these words of the Scriptures to us, your divine message from heaven to earth of a Savior whose forgiveness is ours only through a forsakenness that was truly his 
as he plumbed the depths of sin and shame and death itself that we might be called once again the children of God. So hear us, Lord, open our eyes and help us to glory in your cross. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing as we come to God's word, number 523, which is a prayer, spirit of faith. Come down, reveal the things of God, and make to us the Godhead known, and point to Jesus' blood. Number 523. If you would uh, turn with me back to Matthew chapter 26, and uh, passage we read there together, page 832 in the Church Bibles. What we believe, that is, uh, our doctrine about the cross of Jesus Christ, matters very greatly indeed. Remember what Paul says to Timothy, as we studied it recently in 1 Timothy 2. It's the knowledge of the truth that leads to salvation, he says. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all. And that's the gospel that Timothy is to guard and to pass on and entrust to others. And uh, those others are to keep teaching others who will keep 
preaching that saving truth of God. And that truth must be guarded because Paul knows that falsehood will always arise, even in apparently strong and healthy churches. As then, just so today. And there are many who would, who would claim to be Christians, uh, evangelical, even gospel people, but who repudiate, repudiate this idea that uh, Jesus Christ died as a ransom, as a substitutionary atonement for sin. They say it's a morally dubious thing. They say this idea is a huge barrier to faith. Or that it's even tantamount to, uh, as one famous uh, leader said in a book not long ago, uh, it's tantamount to cosmic child abuse. Actually, since that book was written, it was about 10 years ago, um, that man's church in London has not only embraced homosexual marriage, but recently has embraced renaming ceremonies for people transitioning their gender. That's just a reminder, isn't it, that serious error in belief and behavior nearly always go together. And very often, that departure from the truth begins when the cross of Jesus Christ becomes a stumbling block. But of course, that has been so since the very beginning. To those who are perishing, who are blind to the truth of God in Christ. And yet it is that message of a crucified Savior, of one who gave himself as a ransom for us in our place. That alone saves sinners. That alone achieves real and effectual salvation, rescue from the judgment of God for sins. So our doctrine of the cross really matters. In fact, it is quite literally crucial. And if, as, as some people want to say, the cross of Jesus is just a, a symbol of love or a vivid statement of the powerlessness of love, then it doesn't do anything for sinners other than to say to them, well, I feel your pain, or I share your weakness, or I identify with you. But that's not what you want, is it, from a surgeon when your problem is a life-threatening tumor. It's wonderful if your surgeon is full of empathy and feeling for you. It's not likely. Surgeons aren't really known for that. But what really matters in a surgeon is not what he feels for you, but what he can do for you. Will he actually be able to remove that life-threatening tumor from your body? It's no good him making you feel better about yourself, is it? If he doesn't actually do anything to remove the cancer. And you see, it's the same, isn't it, with Jesus' death on the cross. What matters fundamentally is not what Jesus' death teaches me about love and, and faithfulness and obedience to God and love for others. Of course it teaches all of these things to me. Of course it sets for all of us the supreme example of self-giving love. But none of that is of any value to me if my greatest problem is not addressed, which is the infinite problem of my real, objective, culpable guilt. Guilt before a holy God who can't look upon sin and who therefore must condemn me for my sin and for my rebellion against his rightful rule upon my life as my creator, as my Lord. And for my utter failure to, to live up to his purpose for my creation, which is to image him, to glorify him in this world. Now, what I need above all is not just a teacher, but a savior. I need someone to do for me what I cannot do for myself, to reconcile me to God, the God that I am estranged from because of the objective, terrible reality of my sin. And unless there's that message in the gospel, <clears throat> there is actually no gospel, no good news for me or for anyone else. And that's why it's so important for us to see that this gospel, which is the historic gospel of the Christian church about the cross of Jesus Christ, that it is not some arbitrary interpretation about the atonement made up by one branch of the church at one stage in history, and therefore no better than any of the other so-called theories of the cross of Jesus. No, no, no. This is the theology, it is the interpretation placed upon the cross by the Bible itself and by the Lord Jesus himself. 
That we saw last time, didn't we? So clearly how Matthew shows Jesus himself interpreting his own death to his disciples in this chapter. And it is unmistakably presented to us as a death which is a prophesied sacrificial death as the ultimate Passover that delivers God's people at last into their true destiny in the Father's kingdom and does so through the blood of the Passover lamb, through the blood of deliverance from bondage, through the blood of the new covenant that at last achieves real peace and real forgiveness. Look at verse 28 again. This is my blood of the covenant, says Jesus, which is poured out for many, for the forgiveness of sins. But Matthew wants us to see Jesus showing us even more. He is showing us how that forgiveness is going to be achieved and how all these many prophetic scriptures of the Old Testament actually become real in history and become real in our experience forever. To borrow Paul's words from 2 Corinthians 5, Matthew is showing us vividly that in Christ, God was actually reconciling the world to himself. That he made him, Jesus, to be sin who had no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That is, he's telling us that Christ's death was a real work of God for us. And the concept of, of substitution of Jesus as the sin bearer for his people, it runs all through Matthew's gospel. The great whole priority of his book is telling us that sin at last is actually being dealt with by God in answer to all the promises and the prophecies of the Old Testament. That's why before even Jesus' birth, right back in Matthew chapter 1, we're told by the angel that he will be called Jesus. Hoshia, meaning the Lord saves, because he will save his people from their sins. And at the outset of, of Jesus' public ministry, Matthew shows us Jesus being baptized among the sinners in the place of sinners to signify that he stands in our place to bear the sins of many. And then as soon as Jesus is named the Messiah by Peter, the Christ, you remember in Matthew chapter 16, immediately Jesus starts to speak repeatedly about his coming suffering as the servant of God promised by Isaiah who would be wounded for our transgressions. And now here, just prior to his death, once again, he is utterly clear, as we see in verse 28, that the very heart of his mission is the forgiveness of sins. And it is at the cross that it will all be accomplished through the shedding of his blood. Jesus himself is absolutely determined that his disciples will understand what the cross really does mean. Because if they don't, they will thereafter have no gospel to preach. This is where Peter and all the other apostles got their theology of the cross, their gospel. And this is where we also must get our doctrine of the cross. Or otherwise, we will have no gospel to preach, no true gospel. No gospel with power to save, to transform, to truly deliver into the life of the kingdom. So however much some people today might object to Jesus' death as a substitutionary death for sins, as a death where he actually bore the penalty of sins for his people by suffering the wrath of God in his own person, through his own death. However much some might balk at that, I want us to see that this is precisely what Jesus himself is teaching his disciple by the very way he orchestrates the events of his last hours with them. And that this is exactly what Matthew is at pains to highlight in his presentation of these things in Matthew 26. He is telling us not only is, is Jesus' death on the cross a prophesied sacrificial death fulfilling the ultimate Passover, He's telling us it achieved that because it was a purposeful substitutionary death for sins. Matthew is proclaiming here unmistakably that the cross of Jesus Christ was a purposeful substitutionary atonement for sin. 
And he makes that so clear just by the way he, he records these dramatic events, putting side by side these two last vital experiences of the Lord Jesus that he has with his closest disciples. Notice that, verse 18. I will eat the Passover with my disciples. And then verse 36. Jesus went with them, with his disciples, to a place called Gethsemane. And each of these shared experiences with his disciples involved a cup that must be drunk, do you see? In the upper room, verse 28, speaks of a wonderful cup of forgiveness for the many. But in the Garden of Gethsemane, verse 39, do you see another cup is to the fore, a terrible cup of forsakenness. And this cup will be drunk by Jesus alone. See, it's a story told in two cups, a cup of forgiveness and a cup of forsakenness. And that's what Jesus' death is all about. Let's think first about this cup of forgiveness. The Last Supper proclaims so vividly that Jesus' death does something wonderful for the many. Verse 28, it works forgiveness despite all the unfaithfulness and the wickedness of the human heart. This is my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. And my, oh my, are those sins not great and terrible? Did you notice as we read the, the chapter that both the Last Supper and the events of Gethsemane, they're preceded, aren't they, by a reminder of the awful unfaithfulness of human beings, even of Jesus' closest disciples, represented by Judas and Peter. It's quite deliberate. We're meant to notice it. Look at verses 20 to 25 before the supper. It's Judas to the fore, isn't it? And his betrayal. And then in verses 31 to 35, it's Peter and his coming denial that's to the fore as they go to Gethsemane. Indeed, all the disciples, we're reminded, are going to fall away because of him. Now, Judas flags up for us, doesn't he, the perversity, the sheer willful rebellion against God that is at the very heart of sin. Look at verse 23. The Son of God is betrayed by one who shares his very food with him. It's the epitome of betrayal. Four times in that little paragraph, that word betrayal dominates it. But the truth is that every human being has been a betrayer since the very beginning of humanity. Adam, created for intimacy with God, to love God, betrayed that love and that trust right at the beginning. And now here we are at the end of the story, the climax of history. And we have the leaders, the priests, the people, the Romans, everybody, even Christ's own disciples, all betray the Son of God here on earth. You see, verse 22, all the disciples say, is it I? Could it be me? And in a very real sense, the answer is yes. You're all betrayers. You're all perverse rebels against God. Therefore, you are all unable to share in the great fellowship with God that verse 29 speaks about there, sharing with his uh, at his table in the kingdom. You're excluded from the joy of God's presence unless there can be real and radical forgiveness. Because that kind of betrayal, that kind of rebellion has a penalty, and that penalty is banishment from the presence of God. Disobedience will bring death, is what God said to Adam right at the beginning, and it did. Yes, death is physical bodily death, but far worse than that. Death is utter exclusion from God's presence. Remember, the gate of the garden was shut. The flaming sword is there. There's no way back. And that's the real problem of human beings who have betrayed their maker. It's an objective problem of God's making. It's not just a subjective experience that we have. It's the penalty of sin. And the way back to God is impossible without that objective problem being dealt with. And only God can possibly deal with it. But there is a way back to fellowship with God again, says Jesus. Through real forgiveness for undeserving, perverse human beings. Verse 28, through the blood of the covenant poured out for the forgiveness of sins, through the blood of the Passover lamb. It's real. It's objective. 
And it's something that God does in the death of Jesus Christ and therefore offers to sinners through the death of Jesus Christ. Drink this cup, he says. It's for the forgiveness of your sins. Notice it's not something that sinful people do. It's something they receive. It's something Jesus gives and we receive from him. There's obviously nothing mysterious or magic at all, is there, in this bread and wine? It's perfectly obvious that Jesus is not saying to his disciples, this is my actual body and blood. His actual body and blood is sitting right in front of them and speaking to them. There's not a hint, not a shred of, of the bizarre idea that, that makes the supper a saving thing in itself. That idea in Roman Catholicism is utterly confused, utterly corrupt. So let's be very, very clear about this. Very important. Jesus' work on the cross does not point to the table and to the supper and say that is the real place of forgiveness for sin. That is where the real transaction happens. It's absolutely the reverse of that, isn't it? He's utterly plain here. He's saying this table and this supper points to my cross and to the great once and for all event that saves us. It proclaims the cross and it assures that what happens on the cross is real. And Jesus is saying here that, that real forgiveness cannot come about any other way. Not from within ourselves. Not from us just imitating Jesus' life and Jesus' love. But only by receiving from God alone that forgiveness that comes through Jesus and as the fruit of his death as an atonement for sin. It must become ours personally, yes. We must drink the cup that he gives, he says. But it can only be given to anyone by him. And that's what it means that, that Jesus came to save his people from their sins, to be a real savior. Not a, not a savior from poverty or from loneliness or from low self-esteem or from anything else. No subjective feeling that we have, but a savior from real sins. And that's every single person's greatest need, according to Jesus. Because as he said, all through his ministry, the kingdom of God is dawning. And that means that God is going to judge and remake this whole world. Yes, this is the great awaited salvation all the prophets long for. But also that means, doesn't it? It's the day of God's wrath, of his anger and just punishment against sin and all his enemies. That's why John the Baptist's ministry began with these words, flee from the wrath to come. That's why Jesus' message, his first words were, repent, because the kingdom of God is upon us. And without forgiveness on that day, well, what, Judas, what Jesus says to Judas here in verse 24, that will be true of every single person. Better never to have been born than to face the wrath of a righteous God. Why? Well, because sin against an infinite God has an infinite penalty. And that is the horror of separation from God and from everything that is good and joyful and wonderful. Separation from that forever. And what Jesus himself, all through the gospel, calls the place of weeping, the place of, of gnashing of teeth, the punishment of eternal fire. Jesus' words. But the glory of the gospel, you see, is that he is saying there is a way of escape, a great deliverance from that terrible judgment and into the glorious new covenant of fellowship with God forever. Into the reality that verse 29 speaks of here, rejoicing forever in the home of the Father in heaven, but only through the cup of forgiveness found in Jesus' death for many for all who will drink his cup and make that promise their own. But you might ask, and you'd be right to ask, how can faithless betrayers receive full and free forgiveness from God like that? How could God be just if he just wipes sin away like that as though it didn't matter? Surely justice demands that there should be punishment for terrible sins and crimes. 
Now, we know that, don't we? None of us are perfect, but we all have our right sense of outrage when a criminal gets away with terrible crimes because real justice demands real punishment. And surely a just God must, must demand that all the more so. What about that? Well, that's right. And he does. Sin must be punished. And sin is punished. And that's what Jesus is showing us here in this second cup which must be drunk and is drunk by Jesus alone, the utterly faithful one, for his people, for a people who are not faithful and can't be faithful, even the very best of them. And that's what verses 31 to 45 are all about here, the cup of forsakenness. What we see in the Garden of Gethsemane is the other side of the story of, upper, of the upper room with its wonderful cup of forgiveness. Here is a cup of sheer and utter horror, a cup that speaks of the death of the one in the place of the many, a cup of death for sins, of penalty for sins, full of such sheer dread that Jesus pleads for this cup three times to be taken away from him. Let this cup pass from me, he says, if there's any other way possible. This is a cup of utter forsakenness. And only that makes any sense at all of the sheer agony of the Lord Jesus in the garden here. His sorrow is so terrible, verse 38, he's nearly sorrowful unto death. It nearly kills him. Verse 39, it prostrates him just to be thinking about what awaits him. He fell on his face. It can't possibly be the mere physical death that Jesus feared because when that came, as we know, with all the pain, he was calm, he was silent. And many martyrs have, have faced death, haven't they, with great bravery, unmoved. No, no, no. This was death as no other, a death of untold horror as the wages of human sin, as all our sins were laid upon him. That is what brought horror to Jesus. And that's what the Scriptures foretold. True atonement must be by substitution because judgment is demanded for sin. Punishment must be meted out. And every sacrifice for sin in the Old Testament was full of all of that kind of symbolism. The great day of atonement in Leviticus 16 encapsulates it all. Remember, there were two goats slain. One goat was slain, and its blood was sprinkled on the covering of the Ark of the Covenant, holding God's immutable law to make it the mercy seat, to say that the penalty of sin has been paid on behalf of the people. But there was a second goat, and after the hands of the priest were laid upon it, to symbolically place all the sins of the people on that goat. It was driven out far away into the deep, dark wilderness to signify the removal of sins and of sinners into the desolate wasteland far away from the presence of God. And Jesus knew that his coming death was the fulfillment of all that these things prophesied. His was the real thing at last. He was the, the servant of the Lord that we read of in Isaiah who would be wounded for our transgressions, who would be crushed for our iniquities because, Isaiah says, it was God's will to crush him when his soul makes an offering for sin. And that's why Jesus was so full of agony and sorrow in the garden. He knew more than anyone on earth ever knew. He knew what that meant. He knew the burning intensity of God against sin. The prophet spoke often of that terrible cup of wrath. You can read about it in Isaiah 51 or in Jeremiah 25 or Ezekiel 23 and see how horrible it is. And Jesus knew that this cup was for him. Because the Son of Man, he says in verse 24, goes as it is written of him. And he knew that it meant utter forsakenness. He knew that it meant being separate, cut off from his Father as he became sin for his people. That word in verse 37, sorrowful and troubled, it means intense agony. And one scholar says that the word's root meaning is 
to be far away from home, to be utterly desolate. He is talking of the cup of utter forsakenness, a cup of utter abandonment, a cup of hell itself. That's what awaits Jesus. He was to be the ultimate scapegoat, to bear away sins far away forever into the desolate wilderness, separate utterly from the presence of God. And that is the cup that Jesus Christ must drink, and drink alone, so that we might drink a cup of forgiveness for many. He must drink our cup of unfaithfulness and betrayal so that we may drink his cup of faithful obedience. And even here we see so starkly the contrast of, of the disciples' utter unfaithfulness and betrayal and Jesus' complete faithful obedience to his Father. This time it's Peter to the fore, representing them all. Verse 33, he's full of bravado, full of promises to stand. I'll never fail you, he blurts out. But again, they're all, every one of them, found wanting. And that reminds us, doesn't it, that sin is not just the negative. It's not just the perversity and rebellion in our heart that demands punishment. No, God's, God's law isn't, first of all, a penal sanction for disobedience. First and foremost, God's law is instruction to show man how to live as God's beautiful image, to show him the way of faithfulness and obedience, to show him how to be the image of God's glory in this world. But the truth is that even at our very best, when we want to do that, we fall so woefully short. That's a reality, isn't it? Even our best own intentions are beyond us. So even when we become convicted of our own sin and rebellion and we want to change and we want to go back and we want to obey God, we find we can't. We can't undo the past. Nor can we be what we're meant to be, even if we want to. And so it is with the disciples here. You see, they all betray the Lord Jesus Christ. Not, not with wickedness like Judas did, but just through utter weakness. They mean well but they utterly fail him. See how Matthew makes that contrast so obvious. Look at verse 34. Three times you'll betray me, Peter. Yes, you will. And in verses 44 and 45, three times all the disciples fail Jesus, don't they? They fall asleep three times when all he asks is that they pray with him. While three times Jesus, bearing all the sins of the world, facing the terrible darkness, the agony of utter distress, three times he prays not my will, but thy will be done. You see verse 39? Let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, as you will. In verse 42, my father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And verse 44, the third time, the same words. They couldn't do the one thing Jesus asked of them in his hour of great need. Just like in another garden, Adam couldn't do the one thing that God said, just one tree to leave alone. One thing for me. But in this garden, not like Adam and Eve with the mutual fellowship and company they had and the fellowship with God himself and surrounded by, by such bounty, but alone and in agony and with all the forces of hell itself tempting him to weakness, in his human flesh, so that he was nearly tortured to death, pressing him to take an easier way, to turn his back on the cross, to seek glory without all of that. There, in that maelstrom, this man, the last Adam, the true man, is utterly faithful. The cup set before him, a terrible cup of wrath as punishment for sin, he grasps obediently, faithfully with both hands so that he might set his cup before us, a wonderful cup of forgiveness in his blood, which comes only through that utter faithfulness of him right to the end to do the will of his Father in heaven. You see, the completeness of this double exchange that Matthew is setting right in front of us so vividly, there's a negative side. He bears our punishment as a penalty for sin, our cup, and there's the positive side. His perfect obedience fulfills all, all God's 
positive requirements for man as man's, uh, as God's true image bearer. We drink his cup. All that is ours becomes his. All that is his becomes ours. Bearing shame and scoffing rude, in my place condemned, he stood, seals my pardon with his blood. That's the negative. And the positive, guilty, vile, and helpless we, but spotless Lamb of God was he. Full atonement. Can it be? Yes. His cup is yours because your cup became his. And so we can sing, hallelujah, what a savior. Hebrews chapter 5 says this, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience. He learned the sheer cost of what that meant by what he suffered. And being made complete, he became the source of salvation for all who obey him, all who drink his cup of forgiveness and receive his offering of faithfulness. And can you see how clearly Matthew is showing us, so vividly, Jesus himself explaining what his death is all about as a sacrificial death, long promised, now achieved. The ultimate Passover, delivering from bondage and into eternal destiny as the people of God forever. And as a substitutionary death, purposed by God, but completed at Calvary. And that alone is why it is a saving death. Only thus can God be God, holy and just and pure, and yet, as Paul says, be the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Through Jesus, and only, only through his death, we receive reconciliation, says Paul. God did the redeeming work in the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. He really did take our cup and drink it to the dregs. And so he offers that great reconciliation to us. He holds out to us his cup of forgiveness in his blood. And that is the very heart of the biblical gospel, the gospel of grace. Without that great exchange, there is no glorious evangel. There is no good news. Without that, we are still in our sins and under the judgment of God. But with it, there is reconciliation, full and free, to the Father's house and to the rejoicing in his table. So, friends, what does that mean for you and me today? Well, first, Matthew's message is a very sobering reality check, isn't it? Because it, when it comes to ensuring that we get right with God, that we stay right with him, that we are faithful to him, then what Matthew's message is to us so plainly is we just cannot trust ourselves, can we? Because the honest truth is that like all the disciples, we're all betrayers. We may think that we've never stooped to the wickedness of a Judas, though perhaps some of us may know that we have. But who of us can possibly think that we could outstrip the disciples, Peter and all the rest? Haven't, haven't we also let Jesus down? Even the best of us have, and we'll do it again. Verse 41 is so true, isn't it? The spirit is willing, but the flesh is so weak. And so, friends, we must be real. We can't trust ourselves. And unless you swallow that truth, unless you're honest about yourself, you are hiding in a make-believe world just like Peter and Judas. You can't trust yourself. But you can trust the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the wonderful message shining out of this chapter to us. Surrounded by betrayal, surrounded by the wickedness and the weakness of humanity, Jesus Christ is faithful to the last. He will not betray his Father. He will not betray his calling. He will not betray his people, those he came to save. And that means he'll never betray you or me if we trust in him. 
And we can trust in him. He's committed to us. He is faithful. You can trust Jesus Christ never to let you down. You can trust Jesus for your past, whatever your betrayal, whether it's through weakness or through outright wickedness. His cup is for you so that your cup is for him forever. My Savior's obedience and blood hides all my transgressions from view. You can trust Jesus Christ for your past. And you can trust Jesus for your present. He's committed to you now. He will never let you go. Yes, you will still disappoint him. But he is the faithful one who will never fail you. Eternity will not erase your name from the palms of his hands. Did you notice in verses 32 and 33 there? Even as Jesus is telling them about their total desertion of him, he is immediately promising to them he will be going ahead of them into Galilee. And even in the midst of your stumblings and failures and mine, he is committed to us. He is committed to giving us his cup and taking our cup. You can trust Jesus today, whatever your situation may be. And you can trust the Lord Jesus Christ for your future. If you've drunk his cup of forgiveness now, Jesus is plain. You will drink that cup of joy in the Father's presence. That's his promise in verse 29. However dark your experience, however forsaken you might feel at times, and however you might fear that it will be that at the end of your life, in the darkness of death, it cannot be. It will not be. No, he, he was forsaken so that you and I need never, ever, ever be forsaken. You can trust Jesus Christ right to the end and right at the end of your life because he tasted that cup of bitter forsakenness so that you and I might sup forever in that cup of bountiful forgiveness. This is the gospel of Christ. And thanks be to God. Amen. Let's pray. Grant, we beseech thee, almighty God, that we for our evil deeds do worthily desire to be punished by the comfort of thy grace may be mercifully relieved through our Lord Jesus Christ in whose name we pray Amen well as we close we sing together hymn number three a response of faith and trust. Jesus, I will trust you. Trust you with my soul. Guilty, lost, and helpless, you can make me whole. Who like you in heaven or on earth could be? You have died for sinners, and therefore, Lord, for me. Number 703.
And so may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with you all now and always. Amen.